Greetings, everyone. Welcome to the Periodic Table of History. We've been studying history in four dimensions. The question for today is the history of the Bible. This is a study I've wanted to do for a long time. I did a video leading up to this, which is the history of writing. But now we're going to look at the history of the Bible and how it all came together from its origin all the way to current times. This is the cradle of where writing itself developed, and what I'm talking about is the alphabet itself. The two places that are cited as the oldest writing are right here at Sarabit el Kadim and Luxor, the Wadi el Hol script. Those are something like around 1900 BC. We also have Linear A out here in Crete. Linear A was developed around 1800 BC, the predecessor to Mycenaean script, or Linear B. B. But for our purposes, these two scripts that are in Egypt and Sinai are the most important scripts as far as writing goes. In Exodus 17, 14, there's a scripture that talks about God commanding Moses to write down the commandments. The Masoretic texts have the Ten Commandments being commissioned and written down 1448, some dates are 1446 BC. So keeping all this in mind, we have the Ten Commandments happening somewhere out here. The Bible says they were created by the hand of God on a mountain in Arabia. I really like the work of Ron Wyatt, and he did research on this and hypothesized the Red Sea crossing being right over here, going from Egypt into Sinai, and then the Jebel El Laz mountain. It was so named because the top of it is black. So let's zoom in here and just look at it for a second because it is fascinating. You can see the top of it being discolored compared to the other mountains around it. That is kind of fascinating. And as a hiker, I just kind of drool over getting to hike over here. You can see the Red Sea there in the background. But this is one of the possible locations of where the Ten Commandments were given to Moses. And check out that mountain. Check out the clefts in the rock. Also check out how would you hike up this? Wow, doesn't that look fabulous? I wouldn't hike up it from this westerly side. That looks a little too mm -hmm. steep. So anyway, we look at the text that says, God commanded... Moses to write down the laws. So how did that happen? A lot of research has gone into this, and there's a lot of debate over this, but I go along with the Masoretic text, and that starts here in the timeline around 1450 BC. That would be the exodus of Egypt. So I'm going to put a big arrow there so we can all reference that, and just think about our time scale going all the way from Adam down to the flood, down to Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob, Israelites in Egypt, and then the Israelites exiting Egypt right here, something like 1450 BC. Time passes and we get some more inscriptions that show the authenticity of the Bible. One of them is this Soleb inscription. What's quoted on this tablet is the land of the Shasu of Yahweh. So that tablet is dated somewhere around 1400 BC, and that is a fascinating time scale. So that talks about the existence of Israel being known to the nations around Israel in 1400 BC. Now, there was a new discovery called the Mount Ebal Curse Tablet, and it is right here in this era at the same time as well. And if we learn in Joshua, Joshua said, I set before you the path to life and the path to death, Therefore, choose life. So there was a set of blessings and a set of curses. 
and that should have happened right after Moses, which would be around 1400 BC, because Joshua was going into the land of Israel from Sinai, from the Israelites wandering around for 40 years, and then they went and sacked Jericho, etc., going into the Promised Land. So the time era would be around 1400 to 1350 BC, and this tablet has just been found. It is absolutely astounding. It lists the word for curse several times and Yahweh. So that is one of the most phenomenal discoveries in recent history. Another such really interesting discovery is this one called the Benerpta Stele. It was found in Luxor, Egypt. Next, we move on to about 1100 BC to the Jerobabal inscription, and that was the name given to Gideon. So it's not absolutely certain that this is the same person. It just happens that we have that 1100 BC. So now we are pulling the time of the judges into history because we have archaeology confirming names in the Bible. So what we have here is a possible reference to the start of the Judges and the latter part of the Judges. That would be the Mount Ebal cursed tablet and Joshua and then possibly Gideon with the Jerobeal inscriptions, 1100 BC. So all of these are fascinating finds and it's really difficult to find anything that's past 1000 BC. Writing is very thin past 1000 BC. So these finds are phenomenal. Now we get down into the 900s BC. This would be a little bit after the time of Solomon. This would probably be Rehoboam, Jeroboam time frame. And we're talking 925 BC, Shishak, who is called Shoshenk I in Egypt. This is the triumphal relief, and that was Egypt celebrating victory over Israel. So now we've moved from the time of the judges to the time of kings. So let's go to our timeline here again, just so we can reference that. The time of the judges would have been here about 1400 to 1000 BC, and then you have the time of the kings going from 1000 BC down to 586 BC when Israel is destroyed. So here's the time of King David, then King Solomon. Now we get down into the time of Hezekiah. Let's move over here to the Ket of Hinnom scroll. This is really important, and the reason for it is it is the Aaronic blessing. And look at that date, 650 BC. That is very significant because this is still the time of the first temple. So this writing is actual scripture writing at the time of the kings before the temple was destroyed and it absolutely is scripture. It absolutely is the Old Testament. It's not just a piece or a word. It is the actual thing here, 650 BC. So be sure to take note of this Ketef Hinnom scroll. It's a very important scroll. Now we have the Shebna inscription in Paleo-Hebrew, and that's 600 BC. Remember the destruction of the temple happens in 586 BC in our timeline. Let's zoom in there just for a second. Destruction of the temple, 586. So let's put a marker there. There, so that is pretty significant. Another thing that's really important scripturally is this divorce between the Samaritans and the Judeans, because remember, there is an Assyrian dispersion of northern kingdoms of Israel, and then there's the southern dispersion when Babylon takes over Israel. So now Israel is scrambling and not quite having a place for itself. So we have the Assyrian conquest up here that hit northern Israel. Then we have the Babylonian attack that took out southern Israel. Israel is dispersed to all these nations all around. Now there is an identity crisis for the Israeli people. What happens is a certain group called the Samaritans decide they will divorce from the Judeans. And that happens around the 400s BC. That's important to know because now we have one group of people that decide the Torah. The Samaritans decide the Torah, the first five books of the Bible, is the only thing that's important. And in the Judeans' way of thinking, the Torah and the Tanakh are divinely inspired. 
Things get a little bit more hot when we get into the 200s BC, the 3rd century BC. It was Ptolemy II that ordered the commission of writing the Hebrew Bible into Greek. And remember, the Ptolemies were the residue of the Greeks because Alexander the Great divided his kingdom up among the strong, and the strong were his four generals. One of the generals were the Ptolemies. And so this is Ptolemy II commissioning the Septuagint that we still have pieces of. So that is a big deal. The Dead Sea Scrolls were recently discovered in the 1940s, and they have made big waves since their discovery. They are an ancient source that are used for scholarly comparison of scriptures. So now a lot of the scriptures that we have are just pieces, parts, as they're developing. We have the Nash Papyra, and that's in Hebrew, in 150 B.C. So here is the Samaritan script in 122 B.C., and that is a portion of Leviticus. And remember, Jesus talked to the woman at the well, and what was she concerned with? Well, she was a Samaritan woman, and she said, should we worship here or there? In the Samaritan Bible, the Samaritans built a temple on a mountain separate from Jerusalem, and that's why there was such a problem with the woman at the well, the Samaritan woman that Jesus encountered. They were fighting over where to worship. Now there are a bunch of fragments called the Magdalen fragments found in Egypt. That was around 66 AD, and that's still important because remember that there's just about going to be the destruction of the temple that happens in 70 AD, and that's what Josephus witnessed. So if we go back to our timeline, now we can put a big arrow right here in about 70 AD. So now we've come through 1400 BC all the way to 70 AD. And what was happening in 70 AD? It was the New Testament apostles were going out and spreading the gospel to the Gentiles during this time. Remember the time of Paul and Peter and James and then John all the way up into about 100 AD. Now there's going to be an Old Covenant and a New Covenant. And the New Covenant is starting to play a role in the first century on. Here's the Ethiopic Genesis in the Ge'ez script of Ethiopia. The Rylands Library Papyrus is dated 125 to 175 AD there in Egypt. And here's the Oxyrhynchus Papyri. That is of Amos 2. Now think of the development of the Bible. Now we start having the New Testament. So now there has to be a debate over what is important in the New Testament. So this is called the Syriac Diatassaron. And what that means, the Diatassaron, it's a harmonized group of the Gospels. The Gospels are Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John. So this is created in about 170 A.D., and remember, Syria is just north of Israel, so this language group is called Syriac, and that's how we denote the Syriac diatessaron. Now we're up to 200 AD with the Papyrus 32. That is of Titus. So we're seeing little bits of the New Testament being developed. And there's the Bodmer Papyri. It was found in Egypt. A lot of these papyri are found in Egypt, so that's 200 AD. Egypt is an amazing place that has vaults of information. So we see a lot of these codex coming up in Egypt. So this one is the Codex Glaziar. It's of Acts 1 through 15. This is dated to 325 AD. And the reason why this is pretty important is because now we're getting into the time of Eusebius and Constantine in the 300s. Because remember, that's around 310 to 320 AD. And... That's about the time when Constantine declared Christianity a national religion. It had its good points and its bad points. Now the Codex Versalensis that's in the north of Italy, it's in Latin in 350 AD. So a switch starts to happen between the centers of culture here in Egypt, Syria, Israel, over to Italy, and the centers of learning start to shift. Codex Sinaiticus is in the 350s AD. It's very important because of its dating, but it's also controversial. You either love it or hate it. And then we have the Codex Vaticanus. That's called the Latin Vulgate. Very important. 
This was the Bible that Jerome worked on up in about 390 to 405 AD. The Codex Alexandrinus in the 400s AD is very important. And then we have the Codex Ephraemi in Egypt, very important. So these four, if you are taking notes, these four are impeccably important. See, these are nearly intact, and that's why they're so important, because they're some of the oldest codex that we have, and so much study goes into these four codex. Do you hear Syriac coming up again? Because this is a huge area of learning. Remember, Paul was from this area, because he worked in the church of Antioch in Syria, and then he went up into Turkey, and then up into Greece, Rome, and elsewhere. So the Syriac Peshitta is developed in the 400s AD. And then the Armenian Hexapla, 434 AD. And we have to zoom out once again because Ethiopia comes into play in the 500s AD. Here is the Garema Gospel of Ethiopia. See, each one of these centers is pulling different books together and creating their canon of scriptures. Now we have to zoom out even farther because the missionaries are doing their job far and wide and Bede creates a book of John in English and that's from the Latin Vulgate. That's happening around 672 to 735 AD. And here is another Syriac Peshitta in the 800s. So we're back to Israel now, but also back with a different language, the Arabic script. This is called the Arabicus in 867 AD. Now with all these different languages, the Masoretic people start getting concerned about the authenticity of the translations. So now we start seeing this Masoretic text come up being written from the Masoretes, and their primary concern is absolute quality control, that every document that's copied is copied exactly. And now the Leningrad Codex is one of the examples of the Masoretic texts, and that's from 1008 AD. So now we've gotten close to our millennia. This codex was transported up to Leningrad in Russia, and that's why it is called that Codex Leningrad. So here in Tunisia, we have another group of people who are worried about not the text being copied exactly, but the interpretation being passed on. So this school creates the Targum, which is an interpretive translation of the Bible. Wherever people had questions, they amplified the scripture. So now there are more fights over whether those interpretations are correct. Do you leave the interpretations open or do you force the interpretation through these targums? Here is an example of the Samaritan Pentateuch. This is the Codex Zerbal in the 1200s AD. And remember that the Samaritans were the ones that moved away from the Hebrews and the Judaic Jerusalem interpretation of Scripture. The Persians create a diatassaron, and that's from Syria, because remember the Syrian language is moving out here to the east along the Silk Road. So that happens in about the 13th century A.D. This is an exciting time because now we get to the Wycliffe Bible in England. And I'm going to move the map just a little bit so we can see that expanse. I'll even move out a little bit because remember there's a lot happening down in Ethiopia. Now there's things happening out in Persia, Iran. Things happening in the center with Egypt, Syria, Israel, and then out here into Africa and out into England. So this becomes a very exciting time for writing. And this is right before the printing press. So remember that now we have the German Gutenberg Bible. The printing press is developed in Germany. And the first book ever printed is this Gutenberg Bible in the 1450s. So just think about that expansion of how learning went from Israel and Egypt up to Syria, and then to Ethiopia and Greece, Italy, Persia, and then Italy 
and Italy tried to control the production and distribution of language quite heftily, but now we're getting into the 1400s and 1500s where it's getting a lot harder to put a cap and censor anything, say, the Vatican does not approve of. Multiple priests are translating the Bible in multiple language at this point, and now the Catholic Church has a problem. Now in Germany, see we're in Germany once again, we have the Textus Receptus. This is a big deal too. Erasmus made a complete translation of the Bible in Greek and some parts of it in Latin. This becomes one of the largest vaults of information that a lot of the translations start being created from in Europe. And this is right before the exploration of Europe expanding around Africa and around the world. And so this is the machinery that takes the Bible all over. So remember, we have the problem with the Catholic Church and any translations. Well, Luther tries his hand at a translation, gets into trouble. The Luther Bible is there in 1534 in Germany get the Tyndale Bible, and then the very important Geneva Bible. This Geneva Bible in the 1560s is one of the main Bibles that was transported over into the New World because of England moving over into the United States. Now the King James Bible, this one cannot be understated. This is a big deal, the King James Bible. So now you have a few of these Bibles floating around. Well, one that went to the New World was the Geneva Bible. So now let's go over to the New World. I'll try to go... Yeah, there we have it. The Eliot Indian Bible in 1663. So instead of having the Septuagint and the Latin Vulgate, Greek manuscripts, things like that, now the scholars of America were trying to spread the gospel to the Indians. American Aboriginals using the Geneva translation. So now we move back over here into the Old World and we have parts of the Bible translated into 3,324 languages to date, 2022, and we have the whole Bible translated into 720 languages as of 2022 AD. Incredible. Let's zoom out and get another picture of this. To review and get an overall perspective of this, I'm going to put some arrows on here. And then we'll move into those. It is just amazing to see this evolution that from a small country like Israel, so we have the works of God being recorded down into the most important book in human history. And it starts just from this small country of Israel and spreads out in such a way. So we have the fight with the Syrians and the Israelis. Then we have the center of learning coming over here to Alexandria, Egypt. And there being a vault of information there. The Hebrew is translated to Greek, which moves up into Europe. But at the same time, the Hebrew is moving up into the Greek when the Syrian language is moving to the east, over to Babylon, Iran. Rome tries to take over that learning, and therefore this Greek and the Hebrews start to shuffle around it. See, it encounters this problem here, and that's the Roman Vatican. So the arrows of the Hebrew and the Greek go around, so by the time we get to England, we have the Latin Vulgate plus the Hebrew plus the Greek, and all the best intellect of Germany and England trying to pull together a canonized accurate version of the Bible, and that goes all over the world. We can zoom in here to these different dates where the Bible was translated into these different countries. Now let's move over to Africa. A lot of these dates are relatively recent. 2008, 
1890s, 1896, 1840s. We have the trade route down here, so you see an earlier number, 1776, 1848. We have translations going on in Angola, Madagascar, 1830. We have the 1715 Bible in India, 1793, 1800s, some 1900s, getting over into Thailand. And then here is one of the ship routes in the Malay Peninsula, so 1612. So that's going to go back to the Portuguese and the French and the English that are trying to go through these channels. Let's zoom out a little bit. 1905 in the Philippines, 2019 for the Aboriginal groups in Australia. Japan, 1887. Wow. So what is in this book? What is such a big deal about this book? where so many people would give their lives to protect the authenticity of the Bible. Well, I can tell you truly, to break down the Bible, it's a relationship book between God and man. And though mankind keeps on messing up, God is right there forgiving us so that we can have life. So he sent his son down here. And Jesus said, love God, love your neighbor as yourself. Jesus taught, forgive others, for in the same way you forgive others, you will be forgiven. So when you boil everything down, it's love God, love your neighbor, believe in Jesus Christ, repent so you don't do stupid things, and forgive others when they do stupid things. And I can tell you, other people will do stupid things against you. But remember, you might be doing stupid things against other people. So let's think about those teachings of Paul that says, don't just think really highly of yourself, but think about other people. So I hope this video was good for you. I hope you learned a lot. This study was an amazing flash through time that helped me. I hope it helped you. And God bless you. Go with God. Have a great week, and I'll see you in the next video.